are no product stacks I can think of right now that are more head-scratching than Intel's Xeon E lineup of CPUs. Xeon server chips crammed onto a desktop consumer platform and missing key features from both of its cousins. Today, we're gonna to take a look at Intel's latest neglected child in the Xeon E2400. Talk about its specs, performance, use cases, and try to find out if they should even exist in the first place. Today's video is brought to you by me. Check out craftcomputing.store for all of my official merch and help fund the content that you enjoy watching here on the channel. From custom laser engraved pint glasses to coasters and whiskey stones, and even our brand new double wall insulated coffee tumblers, all of my merch is designed 100% in-house and made to order by me. I'm also now offering flat rate international shipping to 23 different countries. And if you live in the continental US, free shipping on orders over $35. So what are you waiting for? Head on over to craftcomputing.store and start drinking like a pro. Cheers, everyone. Welcome back to Craft Computing, everyone. As always, I'm Jeff. On the desk next to me, or more appropriately floating above it, is the Supermicro SYS511R-M, a one-use server designed for low-power and low-volume installs for small and medium-sized businesses. It's built around a Supermicro X13 SCH motherboard, supporting an Intel Xeon E2400 CPU or 12th generation Pentiums on the LGA1700 socket. We'll get into the CPU here in just a little bit, but right now I wanna walk through the rest of the specs and features of the server itself, which was sent over by Supermicro for this review. Like all reviews on the channel, no money changed hands. Supermicro has no input over the production of this video, nor will they have the opportunity to see it before it goes live on YouTube. And in this case, the server is going to be returned to Supermicro once this review is completed. The Supermicro 815 chassis, which this is built on, is a classic at this point. A one-use server chassis that's incredibly well-built and with an impressive amount of expandability. Up front, we've got four 3.5-inch drive trays connected to a multi-purpose backplane, supporting SATA, SAS, or NVMe disks. Inside the chassis, there's room enough for three PCI expansion cards. There's an X16 and an X8 slot off to the side that both support full height and full length cards, with an additional 4X slot right above the motherboard, with that one limited to small form factor cards. The motherboard itself has an IPMI port for server management, along with a pair of Intel i210 one gigabit LAN ports, which is not all that impressive for this day and age, even considering this is an entry level server. Along with the four drive trays up front, we've also got a pair of M.2 slots on the board. However, they only support speeds of up to Gen 3 by 4. But don't worry, we'll talk all about NVMe and PCI Express connectivity in just a little bit. And last but not least, keeping everything up and running are a pair of 600 watt hot swappable power supplies. Now then, with all that out of the way, let's go ahead and dive straight into the heart of this all new server platform in the Intel Xeon E2400. Intel announced this lineup as a footnote during their December 14th event, which was dominated by news of Emerald Rapid Xeons and AI-centric products. The 2400 series Xeons, like I mentioned earlier, are going to have some fairly familiar sounding specs for both Intel's Xeon and Intel's consumer product lines. Based on LGA1700, it shares the same socket with Intel's 12th through 14th generation consumer chips, although these new Xeons are not compatible with consumer motherboards, so don't expect to drop these into a B760 chipset. Intel has specific server chipsets in the C262 and the C266 that are required to support these new Xeon processors. Most of the motherboard feature set is identical to its consumer counterpart as well, with the same 20 lanes of PCI Express Gen 5 connectivity, along with four CPU Gen 4 lanes. You also get the same USB controller, the same eight ports of SATA, although Xeons now support SAS thanks to their upgraded onboard storage controllers. Moving over to memory, Xeon-based CPUs often have massive advantages over consumer platforms in terms of both bandwidth and stability, with ECC support being not only a standard offering, but often a requirement when it comes to server processors. While ECC is supported on the E2400 series, it only allows for unbuffered modules rather than fully buffered sticks. While any ECC is better than none, this also isn't full-blown ECC support either. Adding registered memory support would not only allow for better ECC, but would also greatly expand the memory capacity of these CPUs. As is, the E2400 Xeons only allow for 128 gigabytes of memory, and is still limited to only two channels, just like the consumer lineup. The only difference is the Xeons allow for unbuffered ECC. But what about the CPU itself? Surely a Xeon CPU that shares its roots with something like an i9-1300 can't be terrible, right? 
Well, this is what I consider to be the biggest miss from Intel regarding the CPU architecture itself. Intel opted to straight up remove the efficiency cores from the E2400 lineup. While that doesn't sound like a huge issue on its face, it severely limits the overall performance potential of these CPUs. E2400 Xeons range from four cores and eight threads all the way up to a whopping eight cores and 16 threads. Yeah, it doesn't sound all that exciting in 2024, does it? For comparison, Intel's consumer lineup using the exact same CPU die can sport up to 24 cores on a single CPU. That is eight cores and 16 threads worth of high power performance cores with an additional 16 efficiency cores for a total of 24 cores and 32 threads. In fact, comparing the specs of the 14900 against the E2488 top to bottom, it gets more and more depressing the more you look at it. The i9-14900, while missing ECC support, can handle up to 192 gigabytes of DDR5 memory, versus just 128 gigs on the Xeon. You get half the number of threads and a third the number of cores. L2 cache is reduced from 32 megabytes to just 24 megabytes. And if your needs include any video encoding or decoding, that's a miss too, as the Xeon 2400s also ditch integrated graphics entirely, meaning no Intel Quick Sync support. Xeon CPUs have never been a great value proposition, especially at the low end of their lineup. But this latest series is a compilation of compromises, and that's before we've even powered on the system that I'm reviewing today. I have to imagine the decision to not include efficiency cores was made to avoid cannibalizing Intel's actual server platform, specifically their mainline CPUs like the Xeon 4510 and the 4514Y. Those are 12 and 16 core parts, and while they are built with performance cores, the turbo clock speeds are laughable by comparison, at just 4.1 and 3.4 GHz respectively. For customers looking at on-prem virtualization servers, if the Xeon 2488 came in with, let's say, 32 threads, I'm sure a number of them would actually consider this lower tier platform, especially factoring in the higher platform costs for motherboard and memory of Xeon scalable chips. But as it is, this maxes out at just eight cores and 16 threads and 128 gigs of memory. So that's the Xeon E2400 series, and suffice it to say, I'm not terribly impressed. But that's only part of today's review. We still need to take a look at this new platform in action. And for that, we've got the Supermicro SYS511R-M. Overall, this comes very well equipped with an Intel Xeon E2488 CPU, the top end choice on this platform. It's the aforementioned eight core 16 threaded chip with a turbo clock of 5.6 gigahertz and 24 megabytes of cache. One advantage of the CPU is its 95 watt TDP, offering a very efficient and low power server option in a 1U package. In fact, despite this being a 1U server, it's surprisingly quiet, at least at idle. I mean, don't get me wrong, it's still the loudest device in this room when I was testing, but I didn't have to wear hearing protection while doing so. For memory, we've got four 16 gigabyte sticks of DDR5 unbuffered ECC running at 4,000 megatransfers per second right out of the box. For storage, we're looking at a pair of Micron Gen 4x4 1.92 terabyte NVMe drives. And like I mentioned earlier, the backplane also supports either SATA or SAS disks if you need some mass storage to go with that as well. In fact, there's quite a bit of flexibility inside of here as far as your storage layout goes. With the pair of M.2 drives inside, you could run your OS on a pair of NVMEs and then run four SAS or SATA disks up front for your mass storage. Around the rear of the server, there's a dedicated IPMI port for Supermicro's BMC and a pair of Intel one gigabit network ports thanks to a matching pair of Intel i210 network controllers on the motherboard. And I think that's where we'll really dive into this review. I've talked a couple of times about one gigabit being fine for a lot of small business servers, but there's no way I'd deploy a brand new box to an office without 10 gigabit as standard. Even if the clients are only connecting over Wi-Fi or one gigabit links, even a couple clients pulling down files can saturate a one gig link pretty quickly. A network card upgrade almost feels like a must here right out of the box. Speaking of expansion, there are only 20 Gen 5 lanes to work with here. And on this particular board, they're all wired into the expansion slots on the back. If you run a pair of cards, you can run these two slots at X8 and X8, but that's really all you get. That's plenty for installing a dual 10 gig or 25 gig network card. And you'll even have room for a small GPU if you want to do some local AI acceleration. But what about storage in your shiny new server? Well, despite the fact that there's six NVMe ports on here, all of those slots are on chipset connected lanes. While the chipset does have 20 Gen 4 lanes and eight Gen 3 lanes available, it only has four lanes at Gen 4 speeds to communicate back to the CPU. 
That means the four drive bays up front and the two M.2 NVMe Gen 3 slots share a single eight gigabyte per second pipe. So good luck getting full speed out of any NVMe drives that you wanna use. Is eight gigabytes per second enough for an entry level server like this? Sure, especially considering at best with a 25 gigabit network card installed, you'll be seeing a max of around two gigabytes per second of throughput over a standard SMB share. Unfortunately, if you plan on running any kind of database or application server off of this box, those shared chipset lanes and lack of system memory bandwidth thanks to only two channels might actually start to become a factor. But a high level of expandability isn't really where I see the server being used most. Most one use servers are deployed for their compute density, not their ability to stack with storage and expansion cards. Looking at straight up core performance, this is Raptor Lake through and through. In Cinemesh R23, the Xeon E2488 managed to beat the single threaded score of my non overclocked 13900K by a score of 2118 to 2063. Unfortunately, it's the lack of efficiency cores holding the Xeon back, with a multi-threaded score of just 16,296 to the 13900K's 37,234. Coming up 16 efficiency cores short means multi-threaded performance is just 43% as fast as its 32-threaded cousin. While that's not a massive deal when you're talking about a gaming CPU, it's a night and day difference in a server. Boxes like this aren't often running at 100% utilization. Rather, they serve clients as they roll in, which is where more multi-threading grunt might have made this a more compelling option for on-prem virtualization. Running an Active Directory server, small file server, basically a small business in a box. While we got the best that Raptor Lake has to offer, unfortunately, we didn't get the complete package. But there's still more to talk about when it comes to the 2488's multi-threaded shortcomings, and it lies in the clock speed and its turbo performance. While the Xeon does boost up to 5.6 gigahertz, doing so on all eight cores means 225 watts of power are being pumped through this 95 watt TDP chip. Where most consumer desktop chips will continue running at their turbo speed, so long as there's enough cooling, the 2488 fell back to its 3.6 gigahertz base clock after just 30 seconds. And it stayed there until you killed the load entirely and restarted a new process. During Cinebench testing, we saw speeds of up to 5.3 gigahertz for the first 30 seconds. But for the rest of this 10 minute test, clocks fell back to their baseline. That's probably for the best, as the CPU temps also hit 100 degrees Celsius in just about 20 seconds of load, and then leveled off to about 55 degrees for the rest of the test. A longer turbo duration could help shore up some of that multi-threading performance, as I managed a score of 19,712 by only running through the rendering in Cinebench a single time good for about a 21% gain over subsequent runs done at 3.6 gigahertz. But it's still a hard pill to swallow when looking at the 13900K and all of its efficiency cores literally running circles around what is supposed to be a server class CPU. Overall, I'm just not that impressed with the all new E2400 series. The Xeon E2488 is the absolute top skew in this product stack. And while single threaded performance is fantastic, it falls absolutely on its face when looking around at even its consumer level counterparts, let alone other server CPUs already on the market. With only eight cores and 16 threads, and considering most of the time it'll be running at 3.6 gigahertz to stay in that 95 watt thermal design, it's a really hard recommendation for me to make, even from a performance standpoint. Looking outside of the meager CPU performance, if you're looking for a server that can handle multiple NVMe devices, it's not looking like a great proposition on this server either, unless you like running all of them through just four chipset lanes. Had I reviewed this platform maybe three or four months ago, I might have had a different outlook on it. But if you look over at recent offerings from AMD with Sienna, you're not gonna get the impressive 5.6 gigahertz boost clocks, but for the same $600 CPU price, you can get a chip like the 8124P, a 16 core 32 threaded chip with six channels of DDR5 memory, including registered ECC support and capacities up to 576 gigabytes. You're also not limited to just eight cores on that platform if you ever need to upgrade or expand, with CPUs of up to 64 cores available as drop-in replacements. For storage and expandability, that entry-level server platform from AMD also has 96 Gen 5 PCI Express lanes, meaning that even entry-level servers can take advantage of NVMe arrays for local high-speed storage without spending tens of thousands of dollars. Recently, I did take a look at AMD's 64-core Sienna CPU inside of a Supermicro 1U chassis just like this. And now that Intel has released their entry-level competitors, it does nothing but solidify my recommendation for that other platform. 
Overall, the Xeon E2400 platform feels like one that you should avoid entirely. With only eight cores at its max, it's unlikely to ever be a platform that can grow with you or your business needs. With only 128 gigs of non-registered ECC support, same story goes. 20 PCI Express Gen 5 lanes and four Gen 4 lanes for the chipset mean expandability for storage or network connectivity are also extremely limited, especially compared to other server platforms currently available. The lack of PCI Express lanes feels constrained even in this 1U server. What about 2U builds, where there might be 12 or even 25 bays up front for NVMe storage? 20 lanes is only going to get you so far. All of these aspects feel like intentional limitations that Intel has put on there, and very purposeful so they don't encroach on their big boy, big data server ecosystem. But just rebadging a 13900, removing the efficiency cores, and allowing for basic ECC isn't enough to compete these days, especially when that same CPU that they rebadged winds up costing more than its consumer counterpart just because it's a server CPU now. Just for a quick comparison, the i9-13900 non-overclocked model is just $490 at retail today versus the E2488 Xeon that's inside of this system, which I remind you has all 16 of its efficiency cores removed, plus no integrated graphics, all in exchange for being able to post with ECC non-registered memory, is over $600 in the tray bulk pricing. Oh, and that AMD Epic Sienna 8124P with three times the memory channels and 96 PCI Express Gen 5 lanes, that's just $620. As far as the system in front of me right now, that is the Supermicro 511R, I, look, I don't know that I would actually sell this platform to one of my customers. While I'm sure it would work fine if all you need is eight core, 16 threads, 120 gigs of memory, and four storage drives. If that's all you need, this platform will run fine. My problem is I like to sell things that you could always upgrade in the future if your needs ever change. And this, is already maxed out. There's nothing more that you can do with this platform if your needs change in the future. I know it's meant to be an entry-level server platform, but it feels so handicapped from the factory, especially compared to AMD Sienna products out there right now, especially considering price points are almost about equal. Sure, as far as build quality, it's the same high quality chassis and fit and finish that I expect Supermicro to deliver in all of their systems. But even the top CPU on this platform doesn't manage to overcome the negatives that I have against the platform as a whole. If you are looking for an entry-level server platform, there's nothing here that makes me recommend it over, say, Intel's actual server lineup or either AMD Sienna or Genoa product stacks. But what do you guys think? Did I miss a glaringly obvious use case or did I sum up your thoughts exactly? Sound off in the comments below. On your way down there, make sure to drop this video a like and subscribe to Craft Computing if you haven't done so already. Follow me on social media at Craft Computing for daily shenanigans like this. And if you like the content you see on this channel and want to help support me in what I do, consider heading on over to craftcomputing.store, picking up one of our brand new coffee tumblers and start drinking like a pro, even before five o'clock. That's going to do for me in this one. Thank you all so much for watching. And as always, I will see you in the next video. Cheers, everyone.